So some of the frequently asked questions that we hear um, from our patients with chronic pancreatitis are related to the role of hospitalizations and how that might contribute to vitamin deficiencies and also how other factors like how we choose our dietary preferences, foods that we're including and foods that we're avoiding. Um, all of these things can contribute to the risk of deficiencies. When we're hospitalized and we have a great level of inflammation occurring in our body, that's not the time that we want to check a lot of these vitamin and mineral levels, because again, some labs are going to be falsely elevated or falsely declined in a state of inflammation. Um, the way that somebody chooses to eat their food and how that food is absorbed plays a big role in the risk for deficiencies. A really easy example is with calcium because calcium, our main dietary source is through dairy products. And whether or not you have chronic pancreatitis or not, lactase deficiency, the enzyme that helps to break up dairy in our diet is deficient in a lot of patients um, and the population here in the United States and around the world. And so we're often concerned about calcium status in an individual who has lactase deficiency. So in that individual that's choosing not to consume dairy, yes, they're at an increased risk for calcium deficiency if we don't have other dietary sources of calcium and or supplementation in place to help prevent that. So we do look at the dietary pattern, foods that people enjoy and foods that people tolerate well to help us determine that risk for deficiency. Um, and I do think that's a really important part about that conversation that you might have with a registered dietitian nutritionist. I always think that this is one of the most important topics is thinking about the formulation of the supplements. The first thing I would say is that if you do not receive a prescription dose, that you should be selecting supplements over the counter that are third party tested. So here in the US, we use USP certifications. Um, we use consumerlabs.com or NSF International Dietary Supplement Certification. All of these organizations test for the accuracy of the label and the bioavailability of the supplement. So that term bioavailability means that the delivery vehicle for those nutrients is actually formulated in a way that can be broken down and absorbed in the appropriate part of the gastrointestinal tract, which is more likely to help improve that deficiency. So I'd say that's the first part is making sure that if it's not prescription, that you're choosing an appropriate um, supplement that's been third party tested. The second part is reading the label um, to ensure that you're getting the appropriate dose of that micronutrient that's been recommended to you. So for example, a lot of people like to take multivitamin and mineral supplements that are in the gummy formulation, but oftentimes the mineral content of those is lower because they're harder to formulate in that gummy um, delivery vehicle. So you may not be getting nearly the amount of calcium that's being prescribed if your provider is trying to um, utilize the, the multivitamin as, as part of your calcium uh, delivery for your diet. Now there's also liquid formulations and sometimes these can be very helpful for patients with EPI. And then sometimes we can see that the way that these are formulated that they might contribute to more diarrhea or looser stools. And so we monitor an individual's tolerance to a liquid formulation. So if you notice that you try one of these formulations and you're increasing the number of stools per day and it's not in the right direction of what your healthcare team is trying to accomplish, this might not be the most suitable formulation for you. So what do I do in my clinic? Um, if I had to give a general recommendation, I would say I typically use USP certified um, either tablets, capsules, or pill forms of a multivitamin and mineral for someone with EPI that's struggling to eat a diverse diet and or absorbing that diverse diet. So if I just need something kind of baseline, that's usually going to be what my recommendation would be. So let's talk about the fat soluble vitamins first, because those are often of a high concern in a pancreatology clinic. 
So again, those fat soluble vitamins are vitamins A, D, E, and K. And these tend to be best absorbed with food. So you're eating the food, you're taking your per, you're taking your A, D, E, and K supplements, and you're hoping that that helps to break up that fat so that it can get incorporated into the intestine. When a patient has a lot of diarrhea, um, they do make water miscible forms of these fat soluble vitamins, and we will often recommend those um, as well in our pancreatology clinic. We do need to be careful about a few micronutrients when we're considering the timing. So for instance, folic acid should be taken without food. Um, so we don't wanna time folic acid up with our meals. In studies, we see that the bioavailability of this form um, is better when it's taken on an empty stomach. A couple other um, interactions that we should think about Zinc and iron, they can bind to some of the components in our diet. So these are often better taken without food as well. And sometimes when we are taking iron supplements specifically, they are at a high risk for causing some GI distress. So if a patient tries an iron supplement without food, because it is better absorbed that way, um, but they start to get a lot of GI distress. So either abdominal pain or cramping or nausea, then we may try taking the iron supplement with food um, or potentially decreasing the frequency um, in some situations to see if it's better tolerated. In any of those situations, it's really important that we're monitoring the patient's progression to achieving normal levels again. So zinc and copper compete um, for absorption and so do calcium and iron. So when we are dosing these micronutrients individually, we're often setting up a schedule with our clients to separate these from one another to hopefully improve the absorption of each of those. So there are lots of skin manifestations, hair manifestations, nail manifestations of micronutrient deficiencies, but there's also a lot of reasons why we can see changes in those physical characteristics that are unrelated to micronutrients. And that's a really important part. People sometimes will look at the health of their nails and their hair, and they'll just start taking over-the-counter supplements to improve those. And that's not always the best. As I just mentioned, there's interaction with micronutrients when we're taking them. So we really need to be careful about what we're taking. And again, communicating that with a healthcare professional. So there's a lot of misinformation out there in this area, but it is true that nutrition can impact each of these areas. Um, typically, once we start to see some of these physical characteristics present, the deficiency is likely moderate to severe. So we really want to catch a micronutrient deficiency before we start seeing any of these physical changes occurring. Um, fat soluble vitamins are soluble in fat. So dietary fat is that delivery vehicle that helps get those nutrients into our enterocyte or that cell inside of our intestine that can then be circulated throughout our body. Um, so that is the most optimal um, way. And that is what I would encourage people to be thinking about is taking these supplements with food and the appropriate dosing of PERT to make sure that you're breaking up that fat. So it's ready to be absorbed. Multivitamins are usually dosed to meet the recommended dietary intakes for those specific nutrients. So if you're dealing with a deficiency, so again, a lab value, your diet's low, maybe that there are some physical characteristics present, usually a multivitamin and mineral is not going to treat that deficiency, that you're going to need a therapeutic dose to be able to do that. And then you can take the multivitamin or mineral to be able to cover your baseline needs after that point. Now, there are ways that we can reduce the pill burden. So for instance, some fat soluble vitamins are formulated together. So instead of taking a separate vitamin A, a separate vitamin D, a separate vitamin E and so on and so forth, that there are some products that formulate all four of those together that again, if there's a deficiency, that type of preparation might be necessary in addition to a multivitamin to be able to treat those fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. Thank you. 
So this depends on my previous discussion on whether or not um, that particular supplement needs to be taken with food or without food. So if we're talking about taking fat soluble vitamins, then yes, these supplements should be taken with PERT um, to make sure that we're getting better absorption of these into the cell. So the answer is not always though, if it is a nutrient that is better absorbed um, without any food in the GI tract. Absolutely. Um, taking over the counter supplementation does not always mean that this is protective. Um, and this is going to filter into one of the next questions I'm going to talk about as well. Um, but let's talk first about um, what can happen if we take an excessive amount of a fat soluble vitamin. So if we take too much A, D, E, or K, um, and we don't, our body doesn't need that. We can store those forms of fat soluble vitamins. And so they're the most likely ones that will develop into a toxicity, but there are also side effects of taking many of the other vitamins and minerals in large doses. And some of those physical symptoms actually may look similar to some of the deficiency symptoms. And so again, it's really important that you're not just self-treating uh, a physical manifestation with a supplement without having somebody pull together the full picture. And again, to address the importance of this as well is that um, there are nutrients, like one good example is folic acid, that when we take it in a really large dose, it can mask other deficiencies like a B12 deficiency. So every time I see a patient in clinic, um, I will ask them about the types of supplementation they're taking, whether it's prescribed or over the counter, look at the dose and the bioavailability and help them to decipher if this should be something that they should continue taking, or if this is something that they should discontinue taking and really putting in some of the education as to why, so that it makes sense. Um, the first part of this, I would say, is that we don't recommend at this point taking any vitamins and minerals that work as antioxidants in large doses to reduce oxidative stress. In many cases, micronutrients that have an, an antioxidant effect can actually function as a pro-oxidant, uh, pro have a pro-oxidant effect um, in a large dose. So you might actually be contributing to the oxidative stress when we take antioxidants in an excessively high dose. Now we've seen that in other conditions. And until we understand a little bit more about the role and the dosing strategies for these antioxidants, I would just encourage that you're just taking um, appropriate doses that are recommended from your healthcare team. So here in the US, um, the coverage for seeing a registered dietitian varies based on your insurance policy. And so oftentimes, unfortunately, that drives how often a patient is able to see or willing to see a dietitian. If you are being treated for a micronutrient deficiency, a follow-up needs to occur every time lab results are coming back in. So that's usually every three to six months. And then once the individual is stabilized, we can decrease this to yearly or even less frequently um, for those individuals that are, are fairly stable. Some people might ask, does it matter if I'm being physically active, if I'm getting enough sleep, um, if I'm exposed to good quality sunlight? The sunlight exposure has the most evidence, uh, right? We know that sunlight exposure can help us to synthesize some vitamin D in our skin. The recommendations for that, you see a little controversy um, from what we might recommend in gastroenterology to what our dermatology colleagues or oncology partners are suggesting. Um, in general, 15 minutes of skin exposure might be safe for those living that are living close to the equator um, to get enough vitamin D exposure. But again, we still need to be monitoring these levels because that might not be adequate for everybody. 
I hope that in the upcoming years um, that we understand more about the sleep cycle and how that impacts nutritional status. It's definitely a hot topic right now, um, but no formal conclusions on the role of sleep and micronutrient status at this time.